All right, hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And this is our inaugural webinar uh, for the UCSF Neuro-Oncology Living Well webinar series. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and thank you so much for joining us, whether you're joining us live or viewing this as a recording. We're happy to have you here. This webinar series is part of our Sherry Sobrato Bryson Brain Tumor Survivorship Program, and the mission of the program is to support those living with brain tumors live their best lives through wellness-promoting information, activities, social connections, and cognitive rehabilitation. My name is Naomi Hoffer, and I'm the program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Brain Tumor Survivorship Program. Also with us today, but in the background, helping with the production of this webinar is Alexa, Alexa Greenstein, who is also an integral member of our Brain Tumor Survivorship Program. Many of you may have met her. She comes to the support groups as well. It, for, on behalf of both of us, it's our pleasure to be with you as we learn together about the important topic of returning to work after a brain tumor diagnosis. If you've registered for this webinar, we'll be sending you a short survey afterwards as a way to hear more from you about what your preferences are for topics and format. So because this is our first one, we really want to partner with you and learn from you and see what works and what you want. We also hope to be developing more meetup chats via webinar so that you can connect with one another face to face as well as through a webinar presentation. The webinar today is on balancing work and cancer and will offer us information and strategies for situations that survivors often face and decisions they make as they consider returning to work after treatment. Joining us today is our guest speaker from Cancer and Careers, Nicole Jarvis. And after that, we will hear from two brain tumor survivors on their personal perspectives as it relates to returning to work. After that, we'll hopefully have some time for questions. And on your screen, you may see near the bottom or, or somewhere on your screen that there's a Q&A function. So please, uh, throughout the webinar, if you have questions uh, and you want to be, address the panelists formally, please uh, submit it using that Q&A box. And I'll be fielding those questions to the panelists after their presentations. Also, you'll see that there's a chat box function for those of you that are joining live and, and seeing the video, there's a chat box. Feel free to pipe in, say hello, uh, and introduce yourself as a way to kind of get to know each other uh, on this platform. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Jarvis as our main presenter. Nicole joined the Cancer and Careers team in 2015. As senior manager, she oversees the website newsfeed, blog, and professional development micro grants program, as well as coordinates all 15 annual cancer and career webinars. In addition, Nicole provides direct support and referrals to the many patients, survivors, and healthcare professionals who reach out to the organization, and she assists with the regional and national conferences. Prior to joining Cancer and Careers, Nicole worked at the Memorial Sloan Kettering for four years in the chemotherapy unit and for a renal oncologist. Upon attaining her master's of social work degree from Hunter College in 2013, Nicole worked as a social worker in the child welfare arena, advocating for parents in family court. So it's my pleasure to now turn it over to Nicole. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you so much for that very warm welcome, Naomi, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I know it's never easy to join in the evening, so I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Um, so before we get started, I do wanna just tell you all a little bit about Cancer and Careers. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us before, we're a national nonprofit that empowers and educates working people with cancer. So we do this through a number of outlets. We have a, a very comprehensive website, uh, it's available in English and Spanish. We have publications also available in English and Spanish, as well as job search tools, including a free resume review service. Uh, as Naomi mentioned, a professional development micro grant program. We also host our own webinars, both for patients and for healthcare professionals, and as well as um, in-person events, such as our national and regional conferences and career coaching. So as we get started, I wanna quickly share a few statistics with you to put the issues around work and cancer into context. So as of 2018, more than 70% of cancer diagnoses were made in adults of quote unquote prime employment years. So that's a clear indication that there are a lot of people who are facing this problem. 
20% of cancer survivors still report work limitations affected by cancer-related problems one to five years after diagnosis. Now, 20% is still is worth noting because it offers a data point that validates what we all know to be true, and that's that the long-term effects of being diagnosed can last long after treatment ends. And then finally, 64% of cancer of surveyed cancer patients and survivors said that cancer recovery is actually aided by the routine nature of work. We find this to be a really strong statement because it demonstrates that we shouldn't just assume that people don't want to work or shouldn't be at work after a diagnosis. This statistic is from our most recent survey we conducted with Harris Interactive. We conduct these surveys about once a year or every couple of years to take a pulse on the major issues that working people with cancer are facing. So you'll notice that these slides are set up in kind of a story arc, and this is to give us some structure to talk about these issues. I imagine many of you are in different places in terms of your own story and the things that you're thinking about. But regardless of where you are today, hopefully you'll find some things to pull out that apply now and perhaps some to take with you for later. Because there's information at every point along the arc that can be applied in different ways along the naturally less structured path that you each individually follow in your real lives. We're gonna to start today by thinking about the various tensions and challenges that come up after receiving a diagnosis. Specifically, when we start thinking about work and life and how everything's going to come together, it's important to recognize that a lot of questions begin to crop up, and sometimes the answers to those questions are naturally in conflict with each other. There are two overarching questions that you can ask to start illuminate the best path forward for you. So first, how important is work to you personally? And what information do you actually need in order to make good decisions about work? So inevitably, this will lead to a host of additional questions because as we all know, what we want is not always what we can do. So then how do we find a path that's workable? Some additional questions to consider include how will work affect your treatment and schedule and vice versa? So certainly talking with your healthcare team about that is going to be very important. You'll wanna think about things such as when your side effects are likely to kick in. As you all very well know, I'm sure, some treatments make people feel unwell almost immediately, in which case maybe they can schedule treatment for a Friday so they have a weekend to recover. But with other treatment protocols, the effects don't really kick in until a few days later, in which case maybe scheduling appointments for Wednesdays makes more sense for you. Obviously, in some cases, your doctor absolutely needs to see you and have you come in on a certain day, but sometimes the dates they propose are merely just the next available slot. So we encourage you to be proactive and ask for times that work best for you because you won't know if you don't ask. It's also really important to talk to your healthcare team about the other parts of your work week, like your commute. You want to find out if it's realistic for you to sit for 60 minutes each way in rush hour traffic, or if your immune system can really handle being in a crowded bus or train during cold or flu season. And of course, no person is only their diagnosis and their job. So what other things will you want to save your energy for? Perhaps you have a new hobby or there's an exercise class you really enjoy taking. Or maybe you're the one who does all the cooking at home or shuttles kids around from sports to school. The truth is, is that each of us has a limited pool of internal resources and energy that we divvy up into our own personal pie chart. And when cancer gets added to the mix, that pie gets smaller as treatment continues and prioritizing becomes even more important. For many people, finances and insurance are usually tied to our jobs and are very important. So often those are the driving factors in determining whether to work during treatment or not. Or perhaps they're important, but they're not the number one reason. Many people wanna continue working because first and foremost, it's part of their identity. It's who they are, particularly in the United States where when we meet someone for the first time, we ask them, what do you do? Not what's your favorite food or where did you last go on your favorite vacation? We're basically asking, how do you contribute to the world? Which is a pretty profound question. So for some people, finding out that their ability to work will be compromised can lead to a secondary crisis, an identity one. In these cases, it can be really helpful to talk to your healthcare team, including social workers, about ways in which you can take care of yourself emotionally if it looks like your capacity to work may become impacted. 
So in an effort to answer these questions and make such decisions, you're going to need to do a lot of information gathering. And this slide illustrates the three buckets into which that information can be sorted. So we've already talked about the first bucket being medical and treatment information, but I want to make another point in that it's important to share specific information with your healthcare team about what it is that you do for work. It's not necessarily enough to tell them I'm in sales or even I'm an administrator at a school. You want to provide details about your day-to-day -day routine and responsibilities so they get a full glimpse into what, you, what your day is like. Now the next bucket is work information. You'll want to look into the benefits you have, such as paid time off and health insurance, but also existing workplace policies, such as donated leaves. This information is typically found in your employee handbook or the initial paperwork that you sign when you get the job. And the third category is legal information. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not an attorney, I am a social worker. So while I am going to talk about the law, I'm going to do so only in very general terms. But I strongly encourage anyone who has specific questions about their situation to reach out to a legal professional, and I'll be providing some resources at the end of the presentation. But the law plays a very important role in thinking about and talking about work and cancer, which is why I include it. Understandably, for some, it can seem scary to think about the law and our jobs, but I want to emphasize here that the point of discussing this topic is not because I think it's likely that an employment situation will become litigious, but rather it's because legal and practical issues do not exist in separate vacuums. Often when there's a practical concern, there is a legal piece to it as well. And so for many people, the law becomes a very valuable tool for helping them create a plan for working through treatment. So as I mentioned, I want you all leaving here thinking that the law is one of the many tools you have to use as you figure out how to best balance work and cancer for yourself. So for the purposes of today, the key law we're going to touch on is the Americans with Disabilities Act. My goal in giving you a little background today on the ADA is so that you know that it's something you can look and should look into further based on your own situation. So to start, the ADA is a federal law, which means that it applies in all 50 states. The part that's relevant to work in cancer comes from Title I, and like all laws, it has certain requirements that must be met in order to use it. So in very broad strokes, they are that your employer must have a minimum of 15 employees for the law to apply to them. You must have the necessary skills, certifications, et cetera, to do the job. And finally, your disability must meet the criteria determined by the ADA. So if you meet all of these requirements and the ADA protects you then the ADA will protect you from discrimination and may also provide access to reasonable accommodations, which we'll spend a few slides on a little later in this presentation. Again, I just want to give you a really quick overview so you know that the ADA is something to consider. Again, I encourage you to speak with a legal professional to determine if you are eligible to use the ADA's uh, protections. So I want to shift and talk a little bit about the online space now. So at Cancer and Careers, we hear often from survivors about the role that the internet is playing in helping them through their cancer experience. For many, it creates a sense of community. Some people blog as a way to make sense of everything that's happening, which can really help them to feel better in the moment. But it also creates a written record of information that can be relatively difficult to get rid of. At the same time, research indicates that more and more employers and hiring managers are Googling employees and prospective candidates. And this isn't necessarily to find something negative, but rather to get additional information about the people that they work with, or to confirm something that they already like about a particular candidate. But still, it's possible they'll come across information that that person would prefer the employer didn't know. So I wanna be very clear that I'm not saying never post anything online. I just think that it's important for people to have a better understanding of the virtual landscape so that you can all make informed decisions about how your story is being presented online. So I'm sure some of you may now be thinking, you know, I'm always very careful with my privacy settings. So doesn't that mean that I'm protected? And unfortunately, the answer to that is that it's a little bit more complicated. Because platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and sites like them are designed to sell us things. And that's to say that they make their money by collecting data and selling it to advertisers. And in order to keep making these new deals with new advertisers, they change their privacy policies frequently and very often without notice. So 
On the plus side, that's one of the reasons why now none of us has to pay for Facebook or Instagram. But it does make trying to keep up with those changes pretty impractical and very time consuming. So the idea here is that you wanna be thinking about the fact that even in those online spaces where you've invited people in and they've invited you in and there are privacy settings, it doesn't mean it's a perfectly secure system. So there are some sites that have a higher level of security such as My Lifeline and CaringBridge and you might be familiar with some of those. But for those of you who aren't, they're both social networking sites that are specifically designed to be a safe space to share updates on your health and your treatment and anything else you want to share. They're a more controlled environment with a higher level of privacy than more of the mainstream social media networks I mentioned earlier. Their privacy policies are often easier to follow and they don't really change quite as frequently. However, profiles on these sites are not automatically protected 100% either. So if you're going to use these sites, you'll want to take the time to read through their privacy policies and figure out what protections are offered by each level of security. And then finally, which ones will work best for you. So as you can see here, there's a link on the bottom of this slide. And that is because we have a uh, sheet on maintaining online privacy. And you can find that online and that will help you to um, fully uh, make your profile on, on these two sites private. So overall, it's a good practice to make sure that you've done your homework regarding privacy on any site, because once information is out there, it's out there. And it can have a potential long-term impact that you may not have intended. So now, if privacy policies provide imperfect protection, what other steps can we take? We at Cancer and Careers recommend developing a personal disclosure plan which includes making clear decisions about what, if any, information about your cancer journey you're going to share, and where you're going to share it in terms of specific websites or blogs. And as you're thinking through what's going to work best for you, it's a good idea to spend some time considering the potential long-term impact of online disclosure. It may be the case that some of you have disclosed at work and everyone is being really supportive, and that is a fantastic situation to be in. But the fact is, is that the internet doesn't go away. So it's important to think beyond right now. So for example, you might find yourself having to look for a new job five years from now, or your very supportive supervisor, uh, maybe move on and will be replaced by a supervisor who starts Googling her new staff. And there's really no way to know how that person is going to respond to the information that they find. And then once you've made those decisions, be sure to communicate them with your friends and family and people that you connect to online. And even if you've shared your wishes with loved ones and those in your network, it's still a good idea to monitor what others are posting so you have an idea of what's out there about you. You may also want to consider your relationship to the larger cancer community. For example, if you volunteer with a cancer-related organization. While you may be okay with disclosing that information, maybe not the fact that you're a survivor. And that's totally fine. You can still mention these affiliations. You just want to give really careful thought to the language you use when referencing your involvement. So then the next question is, what can you do to take control of what shows up about you in a Google search? There's actually a lot that you can do. There are plenty of opportunities to take control about what comes up about you in searches by thinking carefully and strategically about what you post online. In a work context, social media is a forum where you can not only tell, but also show people who you are as a professional. Social media sites like LinkedIn, Twitter, and the others you see listed here rank very high in Google searches. So becoming active on these sites and presenting a voice that represents who you are as a professional is an excellent way to help elevate your brand. Now, obviously you wanna keep in mind that different platforms have different audiences. So while you may wanna share on Facebook a new recipe you tried, that's likely less appropriate for LinkedIn. LinkedIn's where you want to go in to weigh on the latest trend in your industry or let people know that you have a new certification. To help you think strategically about what you post, we do recommend running each post through a filter of sorts by asking yourself some basic questions, such as, would I want my boss or coworkers to know this? Would I want this on the front page of a newspaper? Would I want my mother or my grandmother to see this? It can also help to delete posts that no longer represent your interests but just keep in mind that though they are likely to still be out there somewhere, they, they may just be harder to find. So we're gonna transition back from the online space 
into the actual work environment to talk about working through treatment. Um, and this can apply even if you've, uh, even if you're just going for maintenance as well. So what you see here on this slide is a little bit of data to set the scene, which comes from that same survey that I discussed earlier with Harris Poll that Cancer and Careers did in 2018. First, you'll see the first five, the, the top five reasons survivors continue working after diagnosis. Financial reasons and health insurance are obviously very important, but what is it really significant is that 57% of survivors wanted to keep working because they felt productive. And work also played a large role in helping things to feel normal, whatever normal was for them, and to feel busy and productive. Also, 64% of employed survivors, as I mentioned, said that treatment really helped them cope during their journey. So what all of this really illustrates is the point we discussed earlier, that work provides a sense of meaning and purpose, and also that the act of working itself is beneficial for many people while they're going through treatment. So when it comes to disclosing at work, like all the rest of the decisions around sharing this news, it's an incredibly personal decision and, then, and one that really requires a lot of thought. It's also typically not an all or nothing scenario, but just so we are all on the same page, you're not required to provide information about your health or your health history to your employer, current or prospective, nor can they ask. This is something that people get very tripped up on. However, with that said, there can be situations where you might have to share information in order to access your rights under the law. So this doesn't mean sharing every last detail about your diagnosis or your prognosis. It just means that you might have to provide some support for why you're eligible to ask for whatever it is that you're asking for. For example, it would be really difficult to credibly file a complaint against your employer for discrimination under the ADA if they had no idea, technically, that you had a condition to discriminate against. So as you're thinking through whether to share or not, it's important to consider all of the angles. Now, when I get questions regarding whether or not to disclose, I, I like to say that you can always say more later, but you can never say less. If there's a need for you to divulge more information down the road, I certainly encourage you to be prepared to do so, but you, might, you should really keep in mind that you don't have to offer this information up right away. So now in deciding whether or not to share this information about your cancer status at work specifically, there are two major things to consider overall. First, how will treatment interfere with your ability to perform your duties? And second, what legal benefits are there to sharing this information? So it's important to note that people may want to share, want to disclose for a variety of reasons. For example, personal communication style. Some people are born sharers period. They couldn't imagine going through such a big life-changing event and not telling others. But then there are those who are much more private and in fact feel very uncomfortable sharing personal information about themselves. So it's really about knowing yourself and that however you feel about sharing is valid and should be taken into account. The individual culture of the workplace may also play a big role. Do you work at a small company where your colleagues feel like a second family and everyone chats about their weekends and kids and vacations? Or is it a big corporation where the environment is much more competitive and people are always heads down working on getting things done? Thinking about the various ways people communicate with each other on the job may help you decide if, how, and how much of that information you want to share at work. And you might also wanna think about whether anyone in your workplace has gone through something similar. So while you may not know of anyone who specifically went through cancer treatment, maybe a coworker went out on maternity leave or the guy a few desks over who is, is caring for an aging parent. What kind of flexibilities did the workplace provide for them, if any? And how is the news received, both by managers and other members of the team? Were people willing to step up and pitch in or was there grumbling behind people's backs about having to take on extra responsibilities? It can be incredibly valuable to consider these situations as you think about what you can expect out of your own experience if you do decide to share that information. It can also be smart to consider past performance reviews. So for example, if you've been at a company for five years and always gotten gold star performance reviews and your medical team is now telling you that fatigue is a side effect that you're likely to experience, you may wanna share that information with your employer so there aren't any gaps in understanding if suddenly you're not meeting those same marks you once were. 
because without context, it may simply look like a decline in performance. And if that goes into a performance review, that can unfortunately have a really long lasting impact. We also get asked a lot, who should I tell? As with so much of this, it will vary depending on you and your specific circumstances. It's also possible that you may need to have more than one disclosure conversation. If that's the case, we recommend starting with whomever it will be easiest to talk to. So for many people, that's a direct supervisor because that's who you're gonna have an ongoing conversation with and who can be an advocate for them with the higher ups. But it's also important to bear in mind that most managers were never formally trained to be managers, which I'm sure you guys can all relate to. And in this case, it can put the burden on the employee with cancer to help teach the manager what to do next. So again, there's a link on the bottom of this slide. And this is to our manager's toolkit, or our manager's kit, which can be a very useful tool in these types of situations. Uh, you can download this online or you can order it for free from our website. So for other people, speaking with their supervisor is not an option. So they may want to go to human resources instead if their company has a, an HR department. But perhaps the most important thing to convey in any of these conversations is the idea that treatment is going to be fluid. What you're sharing is what you know today, but that might not apply next month or six months from now. And so this is likely going to be an ongoing conversation. So with all of that said, the idea of simply getting the ball rolling in terms of a conversation at work is one that can be intimidating for a lot of survivors, which is totally understandable. So here are just a couple of examples of how you might start that conversation. If this exact language were to work for you, you're absolutely welcome to use it. Otherwise, you'll want to revise it so it feels more comfortable or relevant. But overall, when you're preparing to begin these conversations, you want to be sure to weave in the idea that you want to collaborate with your employer to create a plan that ensures that both your needs and their needs are being met. And again, it's going back to that idea of a fluid conversation that could change over time. Now, you'll also want to consider what your side effects may say about you and think about the reality of your physical self in the workplace, how you personally are going to manage the potential side effects of your treatment on the job. There's clearly a wide array of possible side effects. So as we discussed earlier, you want to find out from your healthcare team which are the ones that you are likely to experience and which are likely to, to last longer. And then how those can be managed at work so you can feel comfortable and be productive in your job. It's also important to think about any potential visible side effects, visible physical side effects, especially if you choose or have chosen not to disclose information at work. Because if your colleagues are starting to notice that you're losing weight or losing hair, or that your energy has dropped and you don't seem like your quote unquote usual self, they may start to ask questions. And typically these kinds of questions come from a place of kindness and concern, but they can also catch people off guard and create a situation wherein people end up disclosing something they hadn't intended to. So it's smart to spend some time planning out potential answers to some of those questions so you have them in your back pocket. Again, this is an area where social workers can be really, really helpful. So disclosure decisions at work will drive some of your strategy about how you communicate while at work. One option is to identify a point person, and this may not be feasible in all environments, but in settings where it, where it does, it could be a really excellent solution. Someone you trust who's willing to be a centralized source of information about you, your health, and your schedule can prevent you from having to constantly update everyone on how you're feeling. That person can also be your go-to to find out what's happening at work if you need to be away for a doctor's appointment or any other reason. It's also important to be clear about your priorities and then have a good understanding of what your team is expecting from you and how you plan to deliver it. Whether or not you've disclosed, this is something you should do in collaboration with your supervisor if you can. And then there's the final point about limits. Uh, this can be a real challenge. <laughs> this is a time when it's critical that you're honest with yourself about what you can and can't do at work and that you set fair boundaries and stick to them. Something to keep in mind here is that the way we articulate our needs in the workplace is going to be a lot different than how we articulate those to loved ones. At home, when we've reached our limit or hit our walls, we might be able to express ourselves in a more verbal, loud, slam the door kind of way. Obviously at work, this is unlikely to be acceptable. So then the other piece of this is figuring out where those limits are and recognizing the signs before you reach that point. 
so that you can recalibrate before it happens. So what often helps with this is to rehearse what we call professional no's, and these are just a few examples that I'll let you read quickly. So as we discuss side effects, chemo brain and brain fog is one we get asked about most frequently. As you all know, this type of fog can come about whether you've received chemotherapy or not. It's been shown that sometimes simply receiving a diagnosis can stimulate some of these symptoms. So to begin, there's no magic bullet solution. My first piece of advice is to let go of the idea of multitasking because Studies show that only 2% of people multitask effectively. So basically almost no one is good at it, and I am certainly speaking from my own experience as well. So to combat this, we recommend going back to the basics. Write down a list of priorities, then turn off your phone and email notifications so they don't cause distractions, and focus on one thing at a time. Writing everything down is a good practice, so you always have a record and aren't so reliant on your memory. Try to keep a single notebook with all of your to-do things in one place. Because it's, it's much easier to keep track of that one notebook so that you don't wind up in a meeting with your grocery list in front of you instead of your talking points. Additionally, it's a good idea to take time to rehearse everything from presentations to project updates, even phone calls, particularly if you're in a sales position and there are certain points you know you have to hit on the phone. If you work in an office type environment that has a shared calendar, you may want to schedule time for yourself on that calendar so people know that you're busy and then let your boss and colleagues know that you're going to be unavailable for a little while. It can also take off some of the pressure of feeling like you need to respond to emails immediately and then you're better able to work at your own pace because stress can really inhibit our ability to focus. And so to that point, simple stress relief practices can go a long way in helping you improve your focus at work. Deep breathing exercises or two to three minutes of meditation can be easily done at a desk or in a break room or taking a walk either around the office or just around the block. Just a little bit can go a really long way in helping to hit that reset button that we all need so frequently. So as we discussed communication strategies earlier, there's another strategy that can be used, and that's reasonable accommodations, which I mentioned earlier are one benefit of the ADA if you qualify. Basically, there are tools that can be used to make working through treatment or returning to work after treatment much more manageable. It's much easier to think about how these might work with examples, which we're going to go over in the next couple of slides. But I first want to point out that there's a lot of information on reasonable accommodations what they are, how to use them, how they can be valuable for both you and your employer, through the resources listed on this slide here, the Cancer and Careers website, and also the Q&A section on the ADA.gov website. Finally, even if your employer isn't required by law to provide you with an accommodation, it doesn't mean that making a small modification to your work situation isn't something that's doable. So it's actually easiest to show how accommodations might help you if we're able to talk about some examples. So let's meet Sue. We worked with Sue, who was a social worker and was going through cancer treatment, and work was incredibly important to her, her overall well-being and her sense of self. One of her side effects was nausea, which wasn't necessarily impossible for her to manage, but what she began to note was that it was exacerbated when she was at work to a degree that became unmanageable. She realized that it wasn't as bad at home after work, nor during the same hours on a weekend. It really seemed strange to her that she was so sick at work specifically, and so we zeroed in on that, and through some conversations, realized her office was next to the cafeteria, and that's what was making her nausea so bad. So her accommodation was to change offices, and not that it meant that going through cancer treatment was a breeze, but it certainly changed her ability to work, which for her was really critical. Another example is a gentleman, Frank, who worked in the finance department in an office, and one of his side effects was extreme fatigue. His role included a lot of printing and copying, but for some inexplicable reason, the room where the printers, scanners, and copiers were 
was two floors below him. And the most direct way to get there was via the stairs. So he's going up and down the stairs all day long to retrieve documents, essentially walking extra miles every single day. His fatigue clearly made this process more challenging and ultimately his accommodation was to have a printer at his desk. As you can see, there's no one size fits all accommodation in an environmental way for every person. It's really about peeling away the layers of what's happening in your workspace, which can take some time to do, just as it did with Sue in the cafeteria. And then it's really about being as creative as you can about possible solutions. On this slide is a list of questions you can ask yourself to help identify potential accommodations. For example, can you work a full-time but flexible schedule where you work the same number of hours, they're just distributed differently to maximize the hours that you're feeling your best and most energetic, or perhaps to enable you to go to doctor's appointments that you need. Can you work from home, part-time or full-time? Telecommuting is becoming more and more common and can eliminate a draining commute. Obviously, this isn't feasible for every kind of job, but in some cases, they can provide a great solution, particularly for people who do project-based work. If your job includes allocated break times, is it possible for you to take more frequent or additional breaks? Let's say your schedule entitles you to two breaks and a 45-minute lunch, but what you really need is a total of four breaks in your day. That extra break could potentially be considered an accommodation. Perhaps it's about getting access to special equipment. Let's say you're experiencing numbness and tingling in your fingers, which makes it hard to type on a keyboard. Could you use speak type software instead? Or perhaps it would help if you could shift a non-essential part of your job to a coworker. Let's say you're a receptionist at a law firm and it's your responsibility to change the water cooler, but you can no longer manage that. Again, these examples are meant to help you start thinking about accommodations and also to remove some of the myths around the concept such as accommodations are expensive or unlikely to be approved. The fact is that according to the Job Accommodation Network, most accommodations cost an employer $500 or less, and many cost nothing. So be resourceful and really think about your environment and what might be causing the specific challenges that you're experiencing. And remember that what would make work easier today might be different tomorrow, and that this isn't an on, only a one-time only opportunity. You can always add more as you need. So returning to work can present challenges whether you've been away for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or more. There's pros and cons to returning to a former job. Probably the biggest pro is that it's familiar. You know the players, you know the culture, and you already know how to do your specific job. But then there's also cons that are associated with returning to an existing job. One we hear frequently at Cancer and Careers is the fear some survivors had that they'll always be viewed as the cancer person in their office. We've heard stories about colleagues making cancer-related comments to survivors who are returning to work. And while typically these are well-intended attempts to connect with the person in some way, they can feel off-putting to the person on the receiving end. So cancer-related comments can be addressed using a verbal technique that we call the swivel. It's similar to the professional no that we talked about earlier. It's a verbal formula or pattern, but this one is used in response to a cancer-related comment that might be made by one of those well-intended colleagues that we've been talking about. It involves acknowledging the cancer-related comment, putting an and right in the middle, and swiveling the conversation around to a topic that's more work-oriented. So for example, if someone comes over to your desk and goes, how are you feeling? You can say, really excited to be back. And in fact, I have a few questions about the new time card system. Do you have a minute to answer them? Being able to shift the conversation back to a place where you feel comfortable can be really empowering. And it also indicates to your colleagues that you're still a whole vibrant person with a lot of professional contributions to make. Of course, there are a whole spectrum of comments that you may encounter in the workplace. On one end of the spectrum, there are the well-intended, as there are in so many areas of life, who end up making comments that don't ultimately land in the way that person thinks they're going to. So, for example, your boss may say to you, you know, you've, you've been looking so exhausted recently, I didn't want to overwhelm you by adding more to your plate. Now, for some people, this kind of comment might not be an issue. Maybe they are, in fact, exhausted and have a close enough relationship with their supervisor that commenting on how they look is an okay thing to say, and they appreciate not being given the extra work. But another person might feel very differently and be really bothered by this comment. And for that person, this is another area where the swivel can be useful. 
you could say something along the lines of, I appreciate your concern, but work is a key part of my overall being, overall well-being. And in fact, last night I had some ideas about the project that I'd really love to share with you. And then we move on to those who make comments that are just outright insensitive, such as the example on this slide. You can also see here an example of how someone might respond to such a comment. I'll give you a minute to read it since it's rather long. But what this really drives home is the idea that it can be useful to sit down and think about how you personally might respond if someone were to make a comment like this. So it's language that sounds like you. You might even wanna write it down and practice saying it out loud so the words feel comfortable coming out of your mouth. Again, another area where social workers can be really helpful. So we're going to spend some time talking about the job search. And again, we have some data here from that 2018 survey that we did. We're, here we're looking at responses from patients and survivors who were looking for work. Now first, the top three reasons why unemployed patients and survivors want to work. Again, as with their, excuse me, as with our unemployed survivors, financial reasons were high. Um, but the second set of bullets touches on the disclosure issue among survivors looking for work. 39% feel prospective employers would treat them differently if they would disclose their cancer. You can see there's a fear disclosing would negatively affect their ability to get hired. And then there's a study with fake cover letters um, that researchers found employers expressed 26% less interest in candidates who disclosed a disability than candidates who did not. So this is not necessarily to say that this is a completely negative experience, but just know that you're not alone in what you're feeling. And we're going to spend some time talking more about how disclosure during the, work, during the job search can work. So hopefully that when you walk out of this room feeling more empowered around that that piece to the puzzle, you can feel ready to take it on. So on the next few slides, we're gonna be discussing job hunting specifically. Much of what I'm gonna cover will likely be familiar. Still, I think it could be helpful to review some of the points. We'll be going through them quickly. It's no secret that there are many challenges and unknowns when looking for a new job. So it's important to try to feel as in control of the process as possible. So to start, Remember that it's a fluid process. It takes time and you should think about what you want and not just what you need. Again, talking to a social worker about how you'll manage disappointment and setbacks can be really helpful because there are inevitably some for everyone. And also try to see yourself on an equal playing field as your peers who don't have cancer. That can be really helpful too. At Cancer and Careers, we say that job hunting is like dating. Or for that matter, it's like building any type of relationship. It's all about timing. In both cases, there are various steps involved. The process builds upon itself, and it can be heavily focused on a great first impression. In terms of dating, for example, the first phone conversation with a potential date is going to have a different feel than a marriage proposal. If someone shows up on a first date and shares all of their idiosyncrasies, all the reasons why their last relationship didn't work, it's going to read very differently than if that same information came out in six weeks or six months. In the same way, you're not going to go on a first job interview and admit that you chew gum really loudly, or you're going to be texting your friends all day long, and you're always going to leave your stuff in the conference room after a meeting. The sense we've gotten from cancer survivors is that they tend to hold themselves to a higher standard in terms of how much they feel they need to share right out of the gate, and this is simply not necessary. You don't owe a prospective employer any more than the other job applicants, so I just encourage you to keep that in mind and that it's important to behave appropriately in terms of what stage you're at in the job hunt process. So it's also important to know that, unfortunately, according to one of our career coaches, these days more than 85% of jobs are found through other people versus through job boards or headhunters or ads. So it goes without saying that networking is a necessary part of the job hunting process. I think a lot of people get very, uh, very intimidated by the idea of networking because it feels like they're asking for a favor, which can feel especially challenging if you've been out of the game for a while due to treatment or recovery. But the fact is, is basically anyone can be a source of, of networking. Friends, neighbors, members of your faith community are all potential contacts. 
It's also important to keep in mind that there are great online resources for doing this, such as LinkedIn, which I mentioned, which I would imagine most of you are familiar with. It's like Facebook for professionals. LinkedIn has also become the go-to source for employers looking to hire. According to a recent study, 87% of recruiters surveyed reported that LinkedIn is the most effective tool when vetting during the job search process. Given that it's being used so much to find talent, you wanna make sure that you're utilizing it to its fullest potential. And that's by writing a compelling profile, asking for strategic and substantive recommendations, and posting professional updates and joining relevant groups. I just want to point out uh, there was a 2012 survey done by Career Builder that was reported in the Harvard Business Review. Um, it wasn't specific to an oncology population, but it did notice that 85% of hiring managers and HR managers were more understanding of employment gaps now than they were pre-recession. So while we, we do recognize that this data is on the older side, it's important to understand that the landscape of the job search has changed in such ways since the recession, and some things that we thought would be deal breakers are no longer. So as important as LinkedIn and networking are for your overall online presence and for, and for job searching, they don't replace the time-tested tools of job hunting, the resume and cover letter. As a quick refresher, an effective resume is one that's professional, easy to read, and written with a particular audience in mind. It should summarize your accomplishments succinctly rather than being an exhaustive list of everything you've ever done work-wise. And finally, a compelling resume must be future-focused and targeted towards your career goals. It's also helpful to know that there's more than one type of resume. The most common is the chronological resume, which takes the reader through a candidate's work experience job by job, beginning with the most recent. But there's also the chronological functional resume, which is more of a hybrid and could be preferable for someone with several gaps in their work history. Samples of these can be found in our job search toolkit, which is available online. And we also, as I mentioned, have a free resume review service if you are cons concerned about the way that your resume is. Also vitally important is the cover letter or the cover email, which helps you get in the door. What's key to know about a cover letter is that it should be tailored to the specific job you're applying for and not just a regurgitation of your resume. Rather, it's an opportunity to draw parallels or to highlight an experience that makes you uniquely suited to the role. A lot of people ask us if they should include their cancer experience in their resumes or cover letters, either as a positive or an explanation of some sort. My first response is always do whatever you're comfortable with, but think about it like this. The goal of a cover letter and resume are to get you an interview based on your skills and potential. So in that sense, your diagnosis and treatment aren't really part of that conversation. Another important thing to consider is the fact that if you di if disclose your diagnosis in a letter, it won't be a dynamic exchange in that you won't physically be there when the employer initially absorbs that information. So you won't have the opportunity to explain or answer any questions. Bottom line, no one tells everything about everything during a job interview or even once they're hired. Communicate appropriately for where you are in the process and you should do whatever feels right for you. Even if you are 100% sure that you want to disclose during the hiring process, the cover letter and resume aren't really the best way to do that. If you do feel it's important to let your employer know before you accept a job, and I've certainly met a number of people for whom that was very important, we recommend that you wait until later in the hiring process so everyone involved has a chance to spend time with you and get a sense of who you are as a person and as an employee, instead of just reading that information in your cover letter and putting it immediately into the no pile. So if you think about back to the idea about job searching, it's like dating. It's about sharing information based on where you are in the process. And of course, remembering you are never required to share that information. So we do hear from a lot of patients concerned about a gap on their resume being brought up during an interview and how that might affect their job prospects. And while it is getting more common for HR and hiring managers to recognize resume review, uh, excuse me, resume gaps and, and not necessarily ask about them, thanks to that study that we saw from 2012, it's totally reasonable that they will ask about a gap on your resume. So it's a good idea to be prepared with answers and if it comes up, be future focused, non-specific, and brief. This is another situation where the swivel can be useful. So spend some time figuring out what feels right and comfortable for you if someone were to ask you about it.
are a few more examples as well. And you'll all have access to these slides after the presentation. So what's most important to a prospective employer is how the applicant can solve their problems and meet their needs. So you should be prepared to speak about that. You should practice your answers so you can be at ease during your interview. Another important thing to keep in mind is though cancer is the forefront in your mind, it is not for the person sitting across the table. So you should try to remember that you would be an asset to them and that this is your opportunity to dazzle them with the how and why. While we recognize the importance, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> While we recognize the importance of what the employer knows about you as the job candidate, it's equally important for you to know information about them. And this is one of the upsides of Google's is that you can use it to research your prospective employer, and you should. You wanna find out as much as you can about a company before you meet with them. Because it's smart to spend some time thinking about whether the company is going to be a good fit for your needs. If your interview is a result of having networked with someone there, you might have a sense of what it's like to work with the organization. But you still wanna look for some additional information, such as, is the company well regarded? Are people tweeting about how miserable they are working there? Have there been any discrimination lawsuits? In other words, you wanna do some fact finding beyond the conversations that happen naturally as part of the, conversation, uh, the interview process. Now figuring out what you wanna do requires an information gathering process similar to before. It can help you set you up for success, but you can't go to Google for this one. It's really about taking the time to think about things that most of us don't stop and evaluate regularly. So rather than just taking a leap of faith that there's some groundwork there in place, you might ask yourself, how do you define meaningful in terms of work? Some things that think that means jumping into a job with a charity, but meaning can come in many forms and includes things like what gives you satisfaction. Take an inventory of all your skills, both the hard ones and the soft ones. Make a list as long as necessary to cover them, and maybe run this list past loved ones or former colleagues to see if they have anything to add. Talk to people, have informational meetings with people who have jobs that sound interesting. And again, an area where networking and LinkedIn can be really helpful. The point is to really figure out what's going to work best for you. And clearly the ultimate goal of the job search is to get a job with a new employer. Certainly starting with a new employer has both pros and cons to it. One very big pro is that it's a fresh start and there's no pre-existing cancer identity, so to speak. You can choose if and when you want to share that picture or that information. And it also means that there's no before picture to be in competition with. You might get to start over in a new professional workspace. But then there's also that you don't know much about the basics of the workplace. So you're gonna to have to utilize some energy and emotional focus to figure out the ins and outs and to understand its culture. And also to figure out what you can and can, cannot realistically do in this new environment. Research shows that your first 90 days in a new job are critical in terms of setting yourself up to succeed. So it's wise to spend some of your energy figuring out the landscape of the place that you've landed in, including what the quirks and dysfunctions of the place are, because every company is a little bit dysfunctional, and also figuring out how to best manage your energy. And perhaps most importantly, remember that no one hires a new employee hoping they will fail. They hire them with the intention of supporting their success so that they can be an asset to the company. You'll need to find out what being success successful means in your new job, but keep in mind that hiring a particular person is a conscious choice an employer makes. You're at that job for a reason, and that reason has to do with who you are and your past accomplishments, so make sure to remember that. And I just wanna close on uh, disclosure being a spectrum because I wanna reiterate that one of the mo more important points of this presentation, whether you're returning to an existing job or beginning at a new company, disclosure is a really important consideration. Keeping in mind that it is not an all or nothing decision and understanding what you're comfortable with. And also keeping in mind that the need for sharing may change over time and it is a fluid conversation. So that's all uh, in terms of content for me. Uh, uh, these are just some of our conferences that we have coming up. If any of you are near Los Angeles, we do have a conference this weekend on Saturday. Uh, some of those publications I mentioned can be ordered or downloaded from the link below. We do have some webinars ourselves coming up as well. You can find those on our website. And these are a few of the additional resources, um, particularly the legal resources that I had mentioned. 
and my contact information as well so that you can all feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions or if uh, any circumstances have come up that you'd like any advice about. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a lot of information, really, really great information, and uh, just kind of points out to me all that survivors need to deal with uh, as they consider going back to work, but you really laid it out clearly. I also want to mention, you had mentioned this, but I also want you to know, for those of you who are at uh, UCSF, um, there are some wonderful cancer and career publications that I have at my desk. I've, I've ordered a bunch. If, if you want to stop by and pick them up for yourself, or as Nicole mentioned, you can order them on the Cancer and Career website. So um, these slides will be available, so you'll see the links there. So thank you again. Um, I'm going to mute you now, and uh, Will, I'm gonna unmute you. I am delighted now to have uh, some survivor perspectives, and Will Pierce and Dieter Brommer are two survivors that have generously uh, accepted my request to participate in this. So I think it's really important to hear from survivors themselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Will. Will um, is a partner at Goodwin Proctor Law and he lives in Mill Valley with his wife, his daughter, his dog, and his just newborn son, October 14th. Uh, so he has his hands full. So um, Will, thank you so much for being here. Can you hear me? Um, can you please say a little bit about what it was like for you getting back to work and just anything that stood out from Nicole's presentation that you'd like to reflect on from a personal experience? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes. Okay, this is better. Sorry, I don't think it's going. All right, so first I just want to say thank you um, to both Nicole and Naomi for setting this up. It's been really helpful. And, you know, as Nicole said, I am a partner, or as Nicole said, it's a very, it's a fairly difficult process to get back into work, but a little bit of background. You know, I'm a partner in a law firm here in San Francisco, and I had what's called a grand mal seizure January 1st of last year, and I kind of went through a staged process of how I got back in the office, and what I've learned from it is it's a big, it's a big process of honesty, and it's just like Nicole was saying, that it's, it's being able to disclose the right information at the right time, so when I say honesty, I mean it's a, it's a gradual process of letting them know. And I just kind of want to talk through like the three stages I went through. So I had my seizure on January 1st, wasn't quite sure what it was. Let uh, a few of the people in my partnership were the management position kind of know I was in the hospital, know something went wrong, know something happened. And then as soon as I found out through the MRI what it was, it was a growing astrocytoma brain tumor on my left frontal lobe, which is a very difficult place to operate. And I say that because it was one of those things where disclosure is very hard at that point because it was very hard to determine if I'd come out of it okay and how things would be. So that was kind of the point where I used a little bit, I hate to say it, of arrogance to, to stay in the office because I said to, you know, my employee, to the people I worked with, basically, look, I've got a brain tumor. I've got a great surgeon, which Dr. Berger is. It should be fine. I've got, you know, the surgery is going to be in March of last year. And then what I told them at the time was just me being ignorant. I said, look, I should be able to be back on my birthday. And that was a surgery in March. My birthday's in July. So just think of the months there. And if anyone's had any kind of surgery, you know that that's basically impossible. So I started with that. But then I had the surgery in March. April was kind of a wash. May was difficult. But June was one of those moments where I had that realization that there was no chance I was coming back by July. And honestly, I didn't even know if I'd be able to make it back. And that's what I mean about honesty. That was the honest moment I had with myself where I said, this is far more difficult than I anticipated. This can be a very hard way to get back to my life, to get back to my job, to get back to anything. So that was the moment that I had, I set up a lunch meeting with one of the people I worked with in San Francisco and told him exactly that. I said, listen, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to do this. I was like, my new goal now is to try to start back at the beginning of next year. So that's the beginning of 2001. And I said, I'm going to try my hardest. I'm going to fight hard, but I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. And that was kind of the point where I started to get into kind of a regular routine to get my kind of mind, body, and spirit back, to be honest with you, because after the kind of brain surgery I had, I was not adequate <laughs> with thinking, rationalizing, writing, all those things. So I had to start working through that stage. And then sort of the third step here was about December of, of last year, so December before I came back, you know, I had a couple more conversations where... I still, you know, still said, look, I'm coming back January, but I need to come in very slowly. I 
I need to ease back into work. You know, I, I have my own clients and I let them know that as well, that it had to be a slow, easy, steady process. And that was taken fairly well. And again, I'm stressing again that honesty mattered a lot. It mattered that, you know, I was honest with them in, in June of last year to say, I'm going to fight hard. I'm going to try for next year, but I'm not sure if I can make it. And then right before that January, I was coming back, still had the conversation saying, I'll start slowly and then we'll ease into it. And that was what was not only helpful, but probably the way I was able to get back into my office because I was, among other things, incredibly fatigued even at the beginning of this year. So, you know, my January, my February, my March were slow and easy ways to get back into work. It was seeing a lot of my employees, seeing a lot of my coworkers, easing back in with clients, not doing a lot of deals, just doing some. And then once I got back into that phase of work, once I was able to you know, cooperate and work better, you know, around April, March or April of, of this year is when I kind of started to get back into it, get busier, get my game back in so that now I have my full, you know, full slew of clients. I have the deals I'm on and everything. So it was a hard and difficult process is what I'm saying. And my real opinion on it is that once you're honest with yourself about how difficult it's be, that's when you can start revealing that to your employer or your potential employee. And you don't have to use the cancer, the brain tumor, any of those things but you can use that knowledge of yourself to understand how you can get back to work in a very effective way. Mm -hmm. So that was my big take about getting back into the job that it's a very difficult task. But as I tell a lot of people going through this, it's not nearly as difficult as fighting cancer or fighting a brain tumor. And mm -hmm. I think we should all realize that, that like the battles we're fighting for our own health are far larger than employment battles. So whenever you're having a difficult conversation, just remember that, remember that, you know, you're a warrior in very different ways and you're strong and very, very good ways and you can utilize those things to help work help negotiate with your working abilities things like that um but yeah that's why again i think nicole's top is phenomenal i think she's spot on with pretty much everything there that you know it's, it's a tough task um you know get your own self in line understand what you're doing and then start to be honest with your employer but only in you know in stages so that eventually you can reveal all the information but you know, as Nicole said very adequately, don't put it in a cover letter necessarily unless you're comfortable doing that. Don't put it in your resume. Get in the door first and then work through the process of getting them to like you and then getting them to understand that, you know, you can work just as well with cancer or brain tumor, things like that. So that's sort of my big picture on, um, on just coming back to work and the honesty process of getting there and just sort of, in all honesty, the difficulty of, of making it work. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Will. And just one follow-up question. Did you, I'm hearing you talk a lot about honesty, honesty with yourself, uh, kind of before you disclose to others, getting comfortable with that. Did you find that uh, people, people in your workplace, your clients, your coworkers, um, changed their, their behavior towards you after you disclosed in any way? That is an excellent question. Um, I don't know that they did, partially because I didn't try to let as odd as that sounds, where I wanted to come back, and again, it's like painting a picture. Not all of it was completely true, but I was honest. But I wanted to come back showing them that I was strong, that I could do this, I could get through. So I kind of avoided some of those conversations and just say, look, I have this. And as you know, I even wrote an article on it. And that was the way I could share with them sort of a lot of the insight I had. And that was my way of kind of saying, here I am, here's my article, here's the story, let's get moving. Yeah. Because I had to think of it that way, because I still do talk about it at work now, but I try to make it one of those points of saying, this is the battle we fought, now I'm back here. But it's it's a tough process, you know, it is it is a tough process to have those conversations and yeah. decide what level of honesty you want to have, how much you want to open that up to, whether it's clients, employees, things like that, or whether we just want to say, we fought a hard battle, let's get it to work, let's move on. But it is, it, and again, though, to your question, but also as Nicole noted, it is one of those things where getting back to work makes you feel a lot better because when you've been holed up in bed and whether it's a brain tumor, whether it's your cancer, whether it's chemo, radiation, some other therapy technique, it's exhausting and it's debilitating. And to be able to get up in the morning and go to the office, even if it's not for nine hours, even if it's just for a few, is very helpful just to get your life back and to slowly go through the process of, of recovery. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And um, for those of you that are listening, if you have questions for Will, please type them in the Q&A or questions for Nicole as well. And I'm going to um, turn it now over to, to Dieter. Uh, Dieter, I'll unmute you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, just as a quick introduction, Dieter is uh, he went through the process of finding a new job after his treatment. He is a data scientist and he uh, works in high tech. 
and um, lives in San Francisco in Hawaii. So, Dieter, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicole and Naomi. Hello, everyone. So, uh, as Naomi said, I'm a brain tumor survivor. I had a craniotomy last June. Um, I was working at a company in as late as uh, March of last year, and they were shutting down as startups often do and joining another company. And I, I decided I was going to um, go out on my own and be a contractor. Two weeks after that, I found out I had the brain tumor and I was kind of in a tough spot where I didn't have a job. Uh, and, you know, uh, luckily I'm, I'm lucky enough that I was married to someone who did and our insurance was coming from my wife and that was kind of my saving grace. But over the next year, it was basically like almost exactly a year between when I had my surgery and when I started at my current job, um, I was basically coming to terms with the fact that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be working in the capacity I was working before. Um, and I would really have to rebuild a lot of the basic skills I have to do my um, job. And it's been a very humbling experience, but it's been a great experience. And now I'm, I've been working at the same company for the past six months and um, I've taken a lot of action to kind of get my own accommodations. Now, I think my company is probably too small to qualify for the uh, reasonable accommodation, but luckily it's a startup and things are pretty um, wavy and you can kind of just take what you want. Like for example, I'm at work right now in a conference room. No one knows what I'm doing in this conference room, but just kind of taking little things um, for yourself so that you can implement the strategies you put together um, with the great people on your care team. Great, thank you. Um, so Dieter, what was the interviewing process like for you? I know Nicole had, had mentioned it. So what, what tips do you have for people that are going through the interviewing process after brain tumor treatment and trying to get back in the game? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you can as you can imagine, like the um, or maybe you've heard the the tech the technical interviews for startups are just kind of like they're trying to stress you out. And basically, all of the situations you're told not to put yourself in. Um, at least I, my experience is only with cognitive rehab for um, brain, so I can only speak to that. But they basically say like, don't be stressed. All of these things because my testing shows that when I'm stressed, it just goes out the window. And I, I basically had to come up with a script that I did for these interviews. So where I could read like, here's who I am. And like looking at my resume and basically having it be the same, even though it was different companies, having it be as predictable as possible for myself. And that went all the way into like the different coding aspects of it. And I also found that in my experience, whenever, even if the company claimed to be doing cancer research, it was never in my best interest to mention the brain tumor or to mention my experience. And so I just, once I stopped disclosing, I started getting invited on site and ended up at my current company where they didn't know anything about my health until um, long into my, or not long into my employment, but months into my employment. So what worked for you was not disclosing until you got, you, you got hired. Exactly. And even here, like, to be honest, um, very few people know about my condition. It's kind of on a need to know basis. Mm -hmm. And I really liked um, what Nicole said about how it's a, a spectrum in terms of transparency. Like I'm not completely transparent with anyone, you know, it's work. Um, but definitely kind of, it's been interesting choosing my um, kind of going through that. And if that resonates with anyone, I'm happy to talk about it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to type it into the Q&A. Again, um, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, one question that I see is, okay, let's see. Um, oh, for Nicole, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, I'll un unmute all of you. Okay. Um, do you need to disclose in order to get accommodations? Um, so it's part of that, that spectrum thing. Um, if you are necessarily interested in disclosing your cancer diagnosis, you can, um, if there are certain side effects that would qualify. So 
you know, a disability can be really considered anything that affects your your way of, of living. So it could be breathing, physical, mental. Um, so you don't necessarily, so let's say, you know, for instance, let's say you're dealing with um, neuropathy in your hands, but it, and it's a result of your, your treatment for cancer, you don't necessarily have to disclose the cancer treatment aspect of it. You can just say that you need certain accommodations due to your symptoms of neuropathy. So it really depends on what you're asking for and um, how much you personally would like to share. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and another question that came uh, previously before the before we started the presentation was, uh, how do I know what is too much for me? I'm a supervisor, but I but I don't want to wait to fail. When should I decide that I this is too much for me as a supervisor? Do you have any thoughts on that? How to know when it's too much work? Um, sure. I mean, you know. This, as I mentioned, it's a time when it's necessary to be very honest with yourself, as Will mentioned also. I think you really need to evaluate what, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what are your triggers? Um, is there a way to alleviate some of that? You know, are, there, are, are you managing so many people that it would be impossible to not be stressed out in your role? Um, what are certain things you could do for yourself that would alleviate some of that stress? You know, a lot of people tell me that, you know, the place that they were working at before was a really toxic environment, but should they go back? And, you know, I pose the question back to the, should you go back? Is that something that you feel would be, would be healthy for you? That it's something that you feel you can take on? And, you know, unfortunately, you, you can't tell the future. You can't tell what will be too much, but... Um, you know, you have to kind of take it one day at a time and see what happens. And that's also the beauty of accommodations is that, you know, there's no expiration date of when you can ask for them. So if you return to work and you're finding that things are a little challenging and an extra break here or a schedule change might help you, that is something that you can ask for later on. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I see one more question. Maybe we have time for one more. Um, am I protected from getting fired due to my fatigue or forgetfulness? Is that a protection? Um, that would be a, a scenario where, you know, as I had mentioned, it's, it's hard to be protected from discrimination if you don't disclose a little bit of information. Okay. So, um, you know, unfortunately, being tired and being forgetful aren't necessarily something that people would equate with a chronic illness, right? And so it might be a situation where exposing some information about your diagnosis might be helpful in terms of protections, um, instead of just looking like you are a forgetful person or you know, you're not getting enough sleep at night or you're not taking good care of yourself. Um, it's, it, out of context, it can be a little challenging in that respect. Okay, okay, great. Well, again, I want to thank all of you, Nicole, uh, Dieter, Will, thank you so much for your time. It's really informative. We're going to do more of this. And um, like I said, we're going to be sending a survey to you afterwards for those of you who registered. Uh, and we're going to ask you, how was this for you? Did you like the format? And what other topics would you like to see in these webinars? As well as, would you like to have some meetups where you can talk with one another? in a group setting where we can all see each other. So um, thank you again. Um, well wishes to all of you and please, please be on the lookout for future webinars. Thanks. Thank you.